All right. So for um, the first week and a half of 121, there hasn't been a lot covered yet, but we're going to try to cover what we can for so far. And um, as always, this is kind of a reminder that um, Peer Teacher Central is always open for anyone who has questions, uh, but always feel free to drop them into Discord. All right, we're just gonna be doing this every week. So I'm Sam Pruitt. We also have, uh, is it Kirthika? And Anthony and Reagan. So we're the peer teachers doing this week in review. And yeah, like they said, you can come visit us in Peer Teacher Central on campus or on Discord. Anyway, let's get started. All right, so as we covered, uh, we're the peer teachers who'll be covering this review. Uh, each week, every Sunday from 2 p.m. Central to 3 p.m. Central. Um, we've all taken this class before in addition to some of the upper level classes. So we'll be able to kind of look through the material y'all are going through, see what is, you know, kind of applicable to future classes, uh, maybe narrow some stuff down to help you out. Um, a review, Peer Teacher Central is in Peterson 127. It's open eight to five. And there's usually around two peer teachers ready to help any of y'all that show up. If you need more info, just Google peer teacher TAMU and follow the first link. And yeah, we've all taken this class before, so we know your struggles. <laughs> yeah. So a review of what you already probably know in C++. Comments are the easiest way to, you know, kind of, denote your code and leave messages for yourself earlier. Um, the compiler will ignore any lines that are commented. So if you want to leave a single line comment, you do two forward slashes. And if you want to leave a multi-line comment, you do a forward slash followed by the star. And then you can put as many lines in between the next star followed by the forward slash and type whatever you want in there. And the compiler will ignore all of that. Furthermore, the compiler does not care about white space, but good indentation makes it much easier for us to help you debug your code. So if you are putting everything on the same line, it's pretty difficult to read through and see what is the problem. But if you know you're uh, indenting when you're inside of a loop or pressing enter after each line, after each semicolon, it's pretty, it makes it easier to follow through your code and then help you. Variables are used to store values of a given data type. They must only have letters, numbers, and underscores. They're also case sensitive. They can't begin with a number and cannot interfere with C++ keywords. That would include um, int, string, um, double, anything that C++ has already defined for usage, you cannot call a variable. And each statement must become, uh, end with a semicolon. As far as data types go, C++ has four of them, primitive data types at least. Um, care is a single character, usually only a byte in size. Int is an integer, usually only four bytes in size. However, there are some varieties. You can do a short, a long, a long, long, and these varieties will basically increase or decrease the amount of bytes that the variable will take up. Uh, it'll allow you to access larger numbers um, that you typically wouldn't be able to with just a normal integer. Um, I would say they're not normally used, but there are situations where it could be helpful. By default, um, they're signed, which just means you can have a negative or a positive integer. So something helpful is if you know your number is going to be positive, you can make it unsigned and then it won't allow any kind of negative input or usage. A float is a floating point number, number like scientific notation, four bytes in size. Double has more precision to it, eight bytes, and long double has more precision to that, 16 bytes. So. Same thing with short, long, and long, long integers. Um, you can increase the amount of bytes that you're going to use to store that variable in, and that'll allow you to have 
more precision with your number or star, uh, store um, longer decimal points. And finally, bool is a Boolean value, one byte in size. This is just gonna be true or false, one or zero. So the way that we relate these different data types is through operators. So an operator is anything in C++ where it will take in one or more values of certain types and then output another value, like a very primitive function. So as far as numbers go, we have a few different operators. So we have two categories. We have arithmetic operators and bitwise operators. So arithmetic operators are going to be your standard math functions where you're putting in two numbers and you're getting out a number. So that'll be like addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, those pretty much speak for themselves. Modulo is the percent sign. And that's a bit of a different one. So with modulo, when you put in two integers, it divides the first by the second, but instead of giving you the quotient, it gives you the remainder. So for example, 12 mod 10 would be two. And it's going to go in the standard order of operations. So it'll evaluate whatever's inside the parentheses first. There's no exponent, so we don't need to worry about that. Then it'll do multiplication, division, and modulo going left to right, followed by addition and subtraction going left to right. The other category is the bitwise operators. You probably don't really need to worry about them right now, but it's just going to basically compare the binary values of the two numbers and perform some kind of operation on each bit. So as Anthony covered earlier, we have a special data type called a Boolean. And a Boolean has only two different values. It's either true or false. So really, it's only one bit of information, but our minimum size is a byte, so it has to be a byte. And they're used to represent logical values. So if you have 5 is greater than 3 is a true statement. So its Boolean representation would be true versus 2 plus 2 equals 5 is a false statement. So that's the Boolean value false. And it's represented in binary as either a 1 or a 0. So then with Booleans, we also have two kinds of operators. We have relational operators and logical operators. So with a relational operator, you're taking two data types that can be whatever data type, and you're getting a Boolean out of it. So this is going to be like equals or does not equal, where equals is two equal signs and does not equal is exclamation point equal sign. So with those two, you can put any data types on either side. And as long as they're the same, you know, if, if they're the same value, then it'll return true, otherwise false. We also have greater than, less than, greater than or equal to, less than or equal to, pretty self-explanatory for numbers. We also have logical operators. So logical operators are going to take in one or two Booleans and output another Boolean. So first off, we have the AND operation. And AND will only return true if both of the inputs are true. So true and true is true. But false and true, or true and false, or false and false are all false. OR is the opposite. It will return true if either one of them is true. So for false and false, it'll return false. Otherwise, it's true. Not just returns the opposite. So not true is false, not false is true. And that's represented by an exclamation point followed by the Boolean value. And then last we have exclusive or, and exclusive or is kind of a tricky one. It only returns true if the two values you put in are different. So there's not really a good sign in C++ for exclusive or, um, but you can either use the does not equal operator or you can use the bitwise exclusive or operator. I personally prefer the does not equal, but either one should work. And then for the conditional statements, so conditional statements are used when you wanna run a piece of code only in specific circumstances. So suppose you say, if the user enters a certain input, then you're gonna return the specific statements. So um, if else statements go through that series of, okay, you have this specific condition. And if that is true, then the code below that or within that will execute. Um, so it goes in a certain order where, um, so if the first thing is not true, then and only then will it go to the else step. Um, but if everything is false, it just will go through the entire part of that code. But um, basically, if you have 
one of those conditions being fulfilled, it'll just run that code and ignore the rest of the else's. Um, so if your first condition is fulfilled, it'll do the one thing that that if statement uh, that if statement wants it to do, and then it continues onward. It doesn't look at the other else's. Um, so if none, none of the conditions are true, it just ignores that whole block of code. And then um, switch statements are similar to that, except it's used in cases where maybe you have a certain variable that would go, would be going through a lot of different um, variations in the sense that, okay, you have a certain variable, um, maybe dog, uh, and then you have different cases that you wanna evaluate for it. So maybe if you say case one, um, the dog is a Labrador. Um, and then you want to see, okay, if that variable is this case, then I will execute this block of code. Um, but if not, it'll move on to the next case. So it's similar to an if then or an if else, um, but it, it just makes it easier in terms of syntax. Um, and then if none of these cases is true, then the default block at the bottom will be, will be the one that runs. Um, and so it's usually used for variables. Uh, so you have at the top uh, switch, and then within the parentheses, you put in maybe a variable name. And then for your case, after the word case, you would put in uh, what it could equal. Maybe if you have a variable A, for example, and you wanted to go through the cases where it's one, two, or three, you'd have switch um, A, and then you'd have case one, case two, case three, and then default. And then I think we can move on to the next slide. Okay, so the different loops. The first one is a while loop. And loops are used to repeatedly run through a piece of code as long as a condition is met. So for a while loop, it's while condition. And you'll put a Boolean inside of there. And then if that Boolean value equates to true, you're going to do whatever's inside of the while loop. And um, for while loops, you have to make sure that you don't end up in an infinite loop. So whatever your condition is, whatever the variable that your condition is dependent on needs to be somehow changed throughout your while loops so that if it's increase or decrease or whatever, um, you just don't end up to where it, the condition is always true. It has to eventually be false. And then similarly, a do while loop has do something and then while the condition is um, true. So the difference is a while loop will check the condi condition and if the condition is true, it'll do it. But if for a do while loop, it's always gonna run once no matter what. So it'll do that something. And then if after the first one run through, the condition is false, it'll get out of that. But the difference is a while loop, if the condition is false, it won't go into that at all. Whereas do while, it'll go into it once no matter what. And then for loops are a bit of a bit different because it's, you have your initial statement, which is gonna be a variable. So like a lot of times you use i, so it'll be like n i equals zero or whatever. And then it'll check the condition, i is less than 10 or whatever. And then it'll do what's inside of it. And then it'll um, execute the iterative statement. So it'll increase it or it'll decrease it or whatever it is. And then it'll re-go again. So then it'll say, after you've changed the um, variable, it'll check if the condition is still true. And if it is, it keeps going until the condition is false. Um, yeah, and so here's an example. So this one's saying for in i equals one, so at first i is one, and it's going until it's less than or equal to 10, and then it's increasing each time. So it'll go and it'll say one, one is less than or equal to 10, so it outputs one, you can see in the output column, and then so on and so forth. And it's then it's nine, and nine is less than or equal to 10. It increases, or it prints out nine, then it increases to 10. 10 is less than or equal to 10, so it prints out 10, and then it increases to 11. And then it, when it checks the statement, 11 is less than or equal to 10, that's false. So it gets out of the loop. And the equivalent while loop to that is just different because whereas in the for loop, loop statement, you define the variable and you have the increment, you have to do that separately. So first you have to define n equal i equals one, and then the while loop checks the statement and inside of the while loop, like I was talking before, you have to 
say I equals I plus one so that if you didn't have that statement, it would just keep going because I would stay at one. And so then you would be in an infinite loop. So you need that statement in order to eventually equate it to false so you can get out of the loop. And we didn't include it in the slides, but there are also two different statements that are related to loops. So we have break statements and continue statements, and they're pretty simple. If you put break inside a loop, if that line is ever reached, then it cuts out the loop and just moves on to the next part of code. If a continue block is reached, that's the other one, continue, then it skips to the end of the loop, but then it'll go back and check the condition again. So that's about it for loops and that's about it for the presentation. So if any of you guys have any questions, be sure to let us know on Discord or in Peer Teacher Central. And that is about it for us. Thank you guys for watching.